Hi, and good afternoon. I'm Grace Whiting. I'm the president and CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, and I am so excited this afternoon to be spending this time with you talking about supporting patients, families, and caregivers across the research ecosystem, and for us to wrap up what has been an incredible number of sessions about the lives of real people who are living with rare disease, their families, and the people who support them, whether that's researchers, innovators, other patient advocacy organizations. It is just an honor anytime to be partnering with Global Genes on this important work. And today I'm really excited for our discussion. Before we get everything kicked off, I wanna share a couple of brief housekeeping notes. So the first is that there's a chat box to the left of this video. It lets you interact with each other and with the program staff. And this is a great opportunity to make new connections. Please note that anything that is uploaded, uh, such as links and resources, can't be shared via the chat. So if you want to share links, resources, and other community resources that you think would be helpful for folks, go ahead and share those on the social wall. Any questions you have, you can drop in the questions box. You'll find that to the left of your session video. And questions in the chat are not going to be visible to us um, as speakers, but you can upvote questions from other attendees, and that will help us better understand what questions folks are really interested in answering. And I would say, just as we're sitting here today, this afternoon, having our coffee, having our tea, it's a great chance to go ahead and put your questions in as we're talking. And that way we can keep the conversation going with you and make sure we're responding to what's most important as you're thinking through these issues. You can also select from captioning and transcription options by expanding that same section to the right of your video. And if you have technical difficulties, which fingers crossed, I hope you won't, but in case you do, we've got your back and you can go ahead and click request support. You'll be connected with a technician and they will be very happy to help you. So with all that said, I hope you can you know, take a minute, sit back and relax. I've got um, my tea here and I'm just so excited to talk with today with uh, Jennifer Seidman and with Sharon Rose. And we're gonna just kick things off and, and just accept the reality of the last year, COVID-19, the last 18 months, it has been just a paradigm shift in the way that we live our day-to-day -day lives. That could be everything from taking on new hobbies like bread baking or movie making or sewing and um, any number of creative things to reassessing what our priorities are as COVID-19 recovery kicks into high gear and, and businesses, organizations continue to reopen. So Sharon, I want to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about how how the last year went and, and really what you took away from it? Um, and tell us who you are and, and why you wanted to be a part of this discussion. Sure. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Sharon Nisley, and I am a patient and advocate. And actually, you know, COVID for me, I live alone as a patient. And so definitely, like many others, it was an isolating situation. And literally something hopped into my life that I would not have expected. And it was definitely not a hobby that I would have chosen. But last June, about a year from now, or a year ago, I had a little baby six week old blonde bunny come into my yard. He stuck around and he now lives with me. And the interesting thing about him is that he has a rare gene mutation. And so I, I didn't know this, but he is a little two pound bunny that has, a, um, it's the P gene mutation. And all of the black pigmentation is not he does not have that. And so he is very light and has violet eyes. And he has just become an unexpected COVID coping mechanism. And so it just goes to show that animals really can become a comfort animal. And I really appreciated having him. So that's my takeaway. 
that's that's so wonderful, Sharon. And it, you know, I in in so many ways the connections we've made over COVID, while some of them have been taken away, others have gotten stronger. And the ability to connect with nature is definitely something that I know many of us found solace in this last this last year or so. Jennifer, I, the same question for you. You know, when you think about the last year, sort of, what's your big takeaway from COVID? And tell us, you know, what interested you in being a part of today's conversation. Sure. So um, I think, of course, my big hope and takeaway of COVID, just like many of you out there, is that the world has a greater empathy for the things that people in the rare disease space um, experience sort of in their routine lives. You know, we, we experienced all that isolation. We experienced anxiety over decision making. We were desperate to find who was the expert that we could listen to because you didn't know at the beginning of COVID who you could trust and who you couldn't and where were you looking for your answers. And I and, I, and then on a funny aside, everyone got to hone the skill of just in case planning, which is what rare disease families and caregivers do all the time. We are always in a mode of just in case planning. And I'm going to guarantee you that everybody else here practiced it. You got toilet paper, you stocked up your freezer, you did all the things that that happened during COVID. So I really hope that the world comes away with empathy. And I know I, even though I am a rare disease mom, so I come to this conversation um, as a mom of a child who had San Filippo syndrome. Um, I also am an advocate and fundraiser. My husband and I started a foundation 20 years ago um, to really spearhead very, very basic research. Um, And um, that research is now in clinical trials in three different countries. And and there are multiple clinical trials in my space. But um, I think the other thing I I sort of wanted to add to the conversation today, um, and this will play into my my role in my new career role, is that um, even though we all learned the similarities of COVID, there's still so many differences to the rare disease space. Because Big differences are that we all kind of knew that we were going to come out of this with a vaccine and that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't think that in the rare disease community, we always have that same, we, we have that hope, but we don't always get the view to it the way we did during COVID and the world did. And the other thing is, while we were feeling all of those feelings, the isolation and the anxiety, we were feeling them collectively. Our neighbors were feeling it. Um, the person across the street was feeling it and we could turn to them to talk about it. And that's not always true either in the rare disease community. We don't always have a neighbor or a friend or a person that we can turn to right there to look at and talk about our feelings. Um, And so, you know, I hope that we come out with empathy, but I don't know that we will. And, and um, that's sort of, yeah. Beyond the two, the, the massive amounts of toilet paper that are in my basement, that's my greatest hope for this. <laughs> I, I think that's a really interesting um, insight, Jennifer, because one of the things we know from the national research that's been done on family caregiving in the last year from places like University of Pittsburgh and University of Illinois, Chicago, and even some companies like EMD Serrano working through a global coalition called the Embracing Carers Movement is that so many people and families who are caring for somebody that had a health condition or has a disability or individual patients felt more isolated, but in some ways they also felt that other people were finally starting to pay attention. You know, that the the ambiguous loss that so many of us felt during COVID, we, that that is the kind of strain and stress that people with rare disease carry every day. And, you know, as, as you were talking about those tensions, one of the questions that comes to my mind is, as a rare mom, you know, when did you really realize that there was sort of multiple hats that you were putting on, that you, that you sort of found that space between advocate and mom and caregiver and professional and all of those different hats that you may have been wearing? Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point, Grace, that, um, you know, I think researchers and scientists and the physicians that treat people with rare disease um, sometimes overlook in that the the rare patient, the rare disease family has to wear so many hats. We have to be an advocate either for ourselves or for our child. We have to be 
um, our own personal secretaries to keep track of our medical care. We have to, um, you know, put on all of these different hats that keep things organized. And I think they don't always work in unison. So I know as a, as a rare disease mom, there were a lot of times, and I think in particular, uh, the biggest time I sort of had to choose between my advocacy role and my caregiver role as my, as the mom to a child with a rare disease was um, the moment at which research sort of reached that clinical trial moment. And I had to realize that, that it wasn't going to come in time for my son. He was too far regressed in his disease. And I had to decide, in fact, I had to stand in front of a RAC meeting a month after he died to advocate for the research to go forward, even though I knew that the hope for that trial wasn't going to work for him. And that's why my work at Courageous Parents Network is so important to me, because that's what we do. We sort of um, walk besides families as they're experiencing those psychosocial and emotional um, implications of the ambiguous loss that you just spoke about, or of um, the hope for a trial that may not be materialized for their particular child and situation. And um, I think it's really valuable for researchers to, to think about those byproducts that families have to go through and the different hats they wear. And, and equally, Karen, like you as the patient, you're wearing so many hats. I mean, you, you have to be your own caregiver and your own advocate. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as you were explaining kind of your background, um, I, I, I will explain kind of how, where I'm at and, and who I am. <laughs> I am a patient. I have Klepophile syndrome. I was diagnosed at age 38. I had a lifetime of different issues that we never had answers to or any explanation for. And I hopped online trying to find the, you know, solution. I wanted to fix it and get back to my career and my life. And I found that a lot of people um, who also had klepophile syndrome were lost. We were on a message board and we were trying to wear all those hats that you speak of, um, both parents and patients, trying to keep our lives afloat and also trying to fix whatever was happening. Couple file syndrome can affect any organ and the spine and specifically the neck, so the cervical spine. And parents and patients of all ages were asking all of all the same questions, but not finding answers and trying to figure out who do I see? Who do I see for this issue? Who do I see for that issue? And so it was very interesting to say, okay, everybody's asking those questions, but everybody's lost. And how can we develop a hub or a place that everyone can come to together internationally and ask those questions and also work together to support one another in wearing all of those hats. And so I started Couple File Syndrome Freedom and, and I, I, I'm both patient an advocate as a patient, but also advocate as the founder of Klepophile Syndrome Freedom. That's that's wonderful, Sharon. And you know, one question that you know, as I'm thinking through this discussion, and I and I see one of our um, intrepid audience members is asked is, tell us a little bit more. Let's pull on that thread a little bit more about adult patients that maybe don't have a caregiver or they don't have a care partner because I think it's applicable to research. You know, I see in other places where we do research on the Alzheimer side, for example, there's almost an assumption that, yes, of course, you're going to have um, a caregiver. And then yeah. there's, you know, other conditions like cancer, where you might have a family member who um, is supporting and sometimes researchers don't even notice. So talk to me about some of those tensions. Sure. And and I, you know, I'm I'm a single person. I live alone. And so definitely, you know, I don't, I am, I, I don't really, I am my own caregiver, but I kind of say it as self-care. And um, we have an adult support group for Klepophile syndrome. And uh, this is a big issue. Um, and there are many stories that people could tell. Um, I think it's important for 
um, both researchers and physicians to understand that every patient that comes in or every patient that you're talking to regarding research is going to have a whole different life that's going on. And to give you an example, real briefly, part of clepolophile syndrome affects any bone in the body and the way it is developed. And so my knees are deformed, basically, both of them are. And I was at my orthopedic. And, you know, one of the takeaways that I hope that you'll have today um, is that when it's a systemic condition like clepolophile syndrome, when I'm speaking to my orthopedic about my knees and we're talking about surgery, I have to bring up, but wait a minute, I also have a neck condition, I have a bleeding condition, I have cervical dystonia, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and, and physicians become so focused on the knee that when I was explaining, you know what, I'm going to need a little bit of help after surgery if these things flare up and that you're going to need to know about these things that I need to be intubated differently, that I need, I'm going to have these differences. And he said, okay, well, the next time you come in, bring your family with you and we'll talk about it. Well, needless to say, I haven't been back because it was completely, you know, me saying, you know, I'm a single adult and I'm going to need these things and I'm advocating for myself. And not only did he disregard that, but he disregarded that, okay, not everybody has a big team behind them. So. Absolutely. Well, we are- yeah. Well, I- Jennifer, can I, can I ask on that in particular on the methodology piece? Cause Sharon Rose, what I'm, what I'm hearing as you're describing that is, um, you know, researchers and clinicians make assumptions about, about what it's going to look like. And they d- maybe aren't even always aware of those blind spots. You know, the, fa- the famous study about aspirin protecting your heart, um, you know, there were no women in that trial, for example. And so Jennifer, could, can you speak to that a little bit about what are some of those blind spots that researchers have in, in the work that you've done through the Courageous Parent Network? Yeah, so I think that this is really an important piece of not only just for researchers, but honestly, in the medical field in general. And I think um, similar to Sharon Rose's experience, families families experience um, complications when they're managing the care of their child in that the specialist wants to only look at their little alley. Um, so if they're dealing you know, with the GI tract, that's what they're looking at. And when you have a com- any complex need, you've got to look at the big picture. And I think sometimes our experience at CPN is that in the research field, when families are are making complex decisions about a lot of things, um, we need to also be looking at, at the layers of those complexities to support them. So when they come in to sign the informed consent, they may in fact go right through all of that, but they may look at something like, well, okay, now I'm not allowed to share what's going on with my child with others publicly and in a social forum that I've been relying on. Like I've been relying on um, my co-parents or my patients that are in my same disease space in order to get information and to get my emotional support. And now I can't do that. And I think if we start to look at the complexity of that, that's, that's reinforcing isolation. And so, I think everybody does need to take a broader view and look at not just the logistical considerations, but just like Sharon Rose said, she didn't have a team to bring to the table. That's a psychosocial and emotional, um, she had to go home and feel bad about that in a little bit of a way. Mm -hmm. And also she had to go in and and stern herself up to be her own champion. Mm -hmm. And um, I think even families are facing that even when the child has, you know, a family unit or a mother or father to to sort of come in and be their advocate. And if I can add something, just, you know, a lot of times we are speaking about caregivers and then we're speaking about patients. But I think um, we have to be aware that there is a difference regarding when a patient so basically the person who has the rare disease doesn't feel well 
or they're on different medications that are altering things for them, or they, you know, financially, they can't afford to get to the hospital or they can't travel across the United States and it's them. So they're the person who has the rare disease and they have these limitations and they don't feel well. So it is very different in looking at it from a caregiver versus the patient themselves who is an adult who is trying to find their own care. So they're, they're equal issues, but they are not the same. And I think we need to embrace um, this landscape that we're not just talking about pediatrics. We're also talking about the things that adults face. And Sharon, uh, what would you say, I, I mean, you're exactly right, you know, caregiving and um, having the lived experience as a patient, you know, in a perfect world, the patient voice comes first, caregivers are supporting that. Even patients who, you know, sometimes we don't think of as being able to advocate for themselves still yeah. in many cases can express preferences and, and wants and needs. As, as an adult, what would your advice be when you're thinking about how can researchers really engender trust with you and build those pathways with you and other folks in your network when, when they're working with individual folks who maybe don't have those, those networks? How can they encourage you all to get involved in research and to, and to be a part of these processes rather than you know, sort of not even being aware of the blind spots and, and, and asking questions that just aren't appropriate for every person. Right. And I think, um, you know, in our patient group, so we, we do have a registry through Sanford Cords. And I feel that we definitely, um, our adult group, our support group is the busiest group. So we have a parent group, we have a teen and young adult group, and our adult group is always busy. Um, it's, vi it's instrumental for our patients internationally to come to one another and talk about what's really happening versus their experience when they go into the doctor. And I think most patients are really overwhelmed by that. And so researchers need to find that way to reach out and use terms that they understand and really come down to the basics. You know, I've been watching this um, program this week, and I think sometimes the terminology would get lost from your, av your average patient isn't gonna follow this. And so you really have to be able to reach out and meet the patients where they are. They are just a lot of times trying to stay afloat and their condition doesn't have the treatment that they need. And so I feel like our registry, our patients really have participated, but then you have the data, but then how do you really reach out to that patient and welcome them into the fold, I think is key. Mm -hmm. I, I have to chuckle a little bit because I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting in Washington where some acronym or bizarre term is being used and nobody wants to be the person to raise their hand and say, what, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's such a good point just in general for accessibility. Jennifer, um, yeah, you know, we, would love, yeah, yeah. I would love your reaction. Yeah. So we, um, we tried to um, see courageous parents network dove into sort of the clinical trial space a little more than a year ago. And this came mostly bred through watching my own disease community enter into the clinical trial space, which is relatively new. And, and looking at parents' understanding of the terminology, um, at researchers' understanding of how to explain that terminology to parents and what, and, and getting researchers and, and the study coordinators to understand um, what is the response to some of that. Because for example, it's, it's really great to hear what an inclusion criteria is. And a lot of people can understand what that is on a piece of paper and, and see it, but it's a really different thing to feel it. Like when you sit down and you look at that, you have to say, okay, me as a patient or me as the mom can see that my child is going to fit into that inclusion criteria or they're not. And it's, it's attached to a lot of emotions. And I, what we find at Courageous Parents Network is the more we can demystify the terms and the yeah. more that we can get 
both parents and physicians um, to recognize what those terms cause, the emotional responses and the, and the way we think about them socially, the more likely the outcome is going to be positive. Um, because decision making is really hard. And when families have decisional regret, anybody, a patient, it, it, it doesn't lead to good things. And so we want them to be confident in their decision making and understanding the terms is certainly one part of that. Well, and I wonder on the methodology, because as you both have talked about your networks, I mean, we're, we're talking about networks of people and families that are not huge networks. You know, this, is, this isn't, this is by the very definition of it, these are smaller groups. And yet, when I look at policies, when I look at, you know, research that's being developed or new legislation, everyone wants to stick by the gold standard of the randomized control trial. And um, I'm wondering, Jennifer, if you can touch on a little bit some of the challenges you've seen with these traditional methodologies that require people, you know, to be blinded, so to speak, within the research. What's the real life impact of that? So, you know, the real life impact of that is, you know, research and is attached so much to the word hope. I mean, if you think about how we we couch that in the world, right? We say oh, you know, hope for a cure. And the two go hand in hand. And so when we look at the way some research is set up and we look at when parents are looking at that, and I can really just speak for the parent voice, they're looking at that, they're thinking, well, is that really fair to the outcome of what I'm looking for? Is it even reasonably measuring the outcome of what I'm looking for? Because maybe I just want my child to be able to continue to sit cross-legged on the floor for as long as he can, even if it means his life trajectory might not be as long. And so when those blinded studies come into play or include when parents start to think about inclusion or exclusion criteria, they're evaluating it, not just on a, a headspace kind of way, but they're looking at it from a heart space kind of way. And I think the big hurdle that we need to get over is just acknowledging that. And if we sometimes, I mean, we have a saying at, at CPN, we say all the time, name it to tame it. If you can just acknowledge that a blind study, you know, is going to cause these problems, it may be necessary. There are necessary evils in this world. And, but I think part of understanding that is, is also acknowledging that they're necessary and that they are going to cause ripple decisions or ripple emotions or, um, other impacts that, that we can't just look down that one lane and say, okay, we've set it up right. But, yeah. you know, the research may be set up right, but it's casting off people left and right. Yeah. Sh Sharon Rose, what, what are you thinking on that? Cause I, one thing that strikes me is you mentioned you've got this adult support group. So you can imagine a world in which, you know, you're sharing information about potential, you know, research opportunities or new knowledge but then if you're engaged in research, you may be asked not to share information because it could contaminate the research, but you need that support group. And, uh, you know, I'd love to know kind of how, how do you and your network, how do you approach when you're thinking about, well, is it worth it for me to try to get involved in research? Well, we're really not there yet. Um, you know, we have our patient registry and we've had two wonderful white papers written um, by researchers, but we have not gotten into uh, clinical research at this juncture. Uh, I will say that our, pa our adult patients are, you know, there's some misunderstanding even with the patient registry and the data and information that they share. And our registry has the demographic and kind of the front end information. And then we decided that because clepophile affects so many areas of the body, and I've heard this a lot during the symposium, you know, data, you can collect so much data on these conditions that have, you know, comorbidities and issues that are related and associated that we decided we needed to focus on something that affected all age groups. And that for us was chronic pain and musculoskeletal issues. And so we had a lot of adults asking, you know, well, 
is this going to be, a, 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 you know, a just basic, you know, is this going to be attached to my name? Am I going to be able to go back in and change if I find out, oh, I had this MRI and it showed this, or if this was incorrect? And, and a lot of questions or misunderstanding that, oh, you're going to take this and then you're going to do this, that, and the other with it, and really trying to help patients understand how they were are protected and also how they're helping and what their information does to help the condition long term and as adults mm -hmm. to know that this is you know one of the things when i first got involved in this i didn't realize such that it's such a long haul and and just to explain to adults who know you know what in my lifetime this may not help me out but we do not want any child to go through what we've gone through and to explain that to our adults who have years of knowledge in this condition. They know the ins and outs firsthand and to, and to ask of them, you know, please participate and this is why, even though it may not help you, they're eager to help. They really want to. And so I think that's important for researchers to know that we are all open as organizations to connect. You know, we've got, I've got the pool of patients, all ages. And, you know, it's just a matter of connecting. And you mentioned um, there that y'all made a strategic decision to focus on chronic pain. Now, is that you know, something we talked about as we were thinking about today's chat was disparities in research funding between the pediatric world and the adult world and rare disease and more prevalent diseases. Is that why y'all chose to focus on chronic disease? And are, are you seeing some of those disparities in your work? Well, I think, you know, as everyone knows, chronic pain is such a tough one. And we really are hoping to connect on why why is clopophile syndrome causing that chronic pain and the medications that are out there that we use for other conditions don't really hit the mark and i know chronic pain itself is an issue outside of rare disease and so it actually is tough because you know chronic pain you kind of get lost in the big sea of chronic pain but we're here trying to find out specifically with clepophile syndrome, what, what's causing that. And so we didn't choose it because it's a bigger animal. We chose it because that's our number one lifelong issue. If we could pick one overlapping issue, it's chronic pain right now. Anyway, we'd love to focus on it all, <laughs> but we, you know, we had a large, we um, had a large survey that was done by a fellow patient of mine. So we're completely patient led in what we're doing. And we had to, her survey covered everything. It was a masterpiece. And so we had to pick something out of it. That's, I think that's so important though, is, is having researchers realize that the power of that patient voice and saying, this is what's important to me and, and where you can focus your effort. I want to turn um, to a couple of questions we've gotten from our audience. And this first one, Jennifer, I'm going to, I'm going to point to you. Um, Linda writes that she's the mother of a daughter with a rare disease and and her daughter was finally diagnosed after decades of misdiagnosis. And then when they did eventually find providers and institutions, they really didn't welcome her perspective because they thought her daughter should handle everything herself. That's something that was amplified during COVID, um, but can often be a problem for adult patients who may not be able to be as aggressive because they don't have that energy to constantly be an advocate, to care for their own health, to manage um, the complexities of living with a rare disease. So wondering if you have any reactions or thoughts on that. So uh, um, I feel for you and I, we hear this a lot. We even hear it with our, our um, you know, because we largely deal with families who are caring for minor children. But um, as research advances, of course, so are the children are living longer and families are having to become their child's advocate as the adult. But um, another strategy that we, we employ a lot at CPN and recommend to our families is to always bring another advocate with you, another voice with you whenever possible to hear things that you might not be able to hear. Um, 
but we do hear that it's hard to gain that respect. The caregiver um, sort of gets put in a position of being over here sometimes when they're trying to co advocate when the patient, the child themselves can advocate a little bit for themselves. Um, it gets kind of tricky. I mean, I know in the research field, if, if a child needs a treatment um, during or needs something during the clinical process, and they are capable of signing off on it, they have to sign off on it on their own, even if the parent is really the one, because maybe the child has a developmental issue that doesn't allow them to be authoritative in that way. Legally, there's some legalities that get involved, and it can be very complicated and hard. Um, I think the best thing you can do is be really forthright, both with the providers that you're dealing with, with your child, because you have to be in agreement constantly with them. Um, but just tell the researchers that that's how you're feeling. And Sharon Rose, we have a similar um, comment here in the chat from Mitra that on the patient side of this. And she says, I relate to your stories. I, I have also seen enough doctors who we reached out to become overwhelmed with the number of complications. And I was the one who had to control their reaction and give them support in order to be able to support my son. I see the same thing here um, as others have experienced. We need their clinical expertise, but in many ways, it seems the doctors need our emotional support and guidance to move to the next level. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that piece. So, you know, the other side of this that we talked about um, as we were planning this discussion was the fact that as the patient who's living with the rare disease, you are the expert. And so you may be encountering physicians, nurses, therapists, and having to explain to them the fundamentals of the science um, because they may have never seen it before. So if you could talk a little bit about, about those experiences and and how you cope with having to be an emotional support for someone who's supposed to be taking care of you. Well, I think, you know, as you say that, I have to say, I don't know if I've experienced where the doctor, maybe that they become overwhelmed because you come in, you have 15 minutes. I always have a note card and you know, you're, you know, and it depends, you know, it depends. Um, different patients are able to advocate either in different ways or in different capabilities or are so overwhelmed. You know, as a patient, we've all come in and been so overwhelmed by not finding the answer or feeling awful that, you know, I've had a breakdown or two in the doctor's office, but then sometimes you come in and you might have a list that's too much for a 15 minute appointment, but you need those are valid lists but the doctor can become overwhelmed because they can't solve it all. And I think for physicians too, so it's better if you kind of say, you know what, I'm going to have to look into that. And why don't we set up an appointment? You know, it takes a couple months these days and do that and save the time rather than either saying, Nope, that's not, Nope, that never happens with couple file syndrome or, you know, maybe the doctor didn't have time to look it up ahead of time. And I try to, I try to be reasonable that doctors schedules are jam packed, but at the same time, we are quote unquote, you know, we're the customer. And so we are paying for it. And so I try to try to remind myself of that when I go in and I, I would like some form of a path and the doctor really doesn't have one. I try to say, okay, what can you, what can we do? I'm not going to leave until we have something to try or do, but I can understand it's, it's overwhelming for both the physician and the patient when you've got 15 minutes and you've got a laundry list of issues. Yeah. You know, we, we um, spend a lot of time at Courageous Parents Network um, educating physicians and the providers who care for children with rare disease um, and, and that was our main objective when we recently had an article published in pediatrics about our clinical trial unit was to get those people that are sort of the boots on the ground, the nurses, the uh, pediatricians to really understand how complex making a decision 
to participate or not to participate or having to be excluded from a clinical trial is because those providers are the ones that are seeing those families day to day. And they really need to be the emotional support for those families along the path that they're making all those complex decisions. So we spend a lot of time trying to educate physicians um, to the lived family experience and what are they coming out with at the end. Um, I recently did grand rounds because it was over the internet, but, um, and a physician said to me, every time I have to give a family a rare disease diagnosis, I go on and I watch three or four of the videos on CPM so I can understand what language to use and what language not to use. Because it's really important for those people to understand they're setting that that family or that patient off on a trajectory um, that is going to be scary for that family. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things we all witnessed during COVID is you know, in many ways, our healthcare systems are overwhelmed. And I don't think, you know, for, for most providers, I don't think they're trying to approach things with malice or trying to be cold. They want to do the right thing. They want to have a conversation. But sometimes they just lack the tools to really be able to do that. And when um, you've never seen a condition before, and that patient arrives in front of you and has five, you know, major concerns, you got to be a little realistic on both sides. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I yeah, want I, I want to invite the audience um, and, and then Jennifer will come back to you. But I want to just invite the audience as, as we're coming to the top of the hour that if you have questions or other comments, please go ahead and enter them into the chat box and, and we're happy to, to touch on that. But Jennifer, do you, you want to pick up that thread where, where Sharon just was about um, some of these challenges? I mean, I just, I just really wanted to reinforce when Sharon, what, what Sharon was saying that the burden of so many layers are on, on rare disease patients and families, you know, they have to have, they have to be able, they have to be the medical expert on their child. They have to be the educational expert. Um, they have to know how to manage their career if they have a condition that might impose upon that career or their child does, and they have to um, alter their career choices because they need to now be the caretaker. And when they come to the table to think about participating in research, they're bringing all of that with them. And um, I think sometimes the problem we have is that we don't just acknowledge that, that we don't look at it in its completeness. Um, and then by virtue of that, things don't go well. And I think, you know, as you were saying that, Jennifer, I you know, normally I don't, I'm not able to, as a patient, come to symposiums. So this in itself is a result of COVID of, um, and I'm very thankful to be able to be here. Um, and I think this can be a tool also for researchers to meet with patients mm -hmm. um, and, and have some real time discussions meeting us exactly where we're at. Um, you know, I had a full-time career and when rare disease hit, it hit like a Mack truck. And I've had to completely rearrange my life. But I do not have that advocate that comes with me. I do not have a caregiver or person that can help me navigate just basics in the house here. And so I think it's very important to realize that, you know, it runs a, a large spectrum of what a patient's abilities are, and that you might really have a data set of the people that are available to be there, but you're missing out on a whole other group. Um, and you need, and we need to be better about that. And we need to be better about including the people that aren't able to travel or aren't able to afford that hotel room for three days or whatever the case may be doesn't people who don't have a caregiver for their other um, children and their family while they go. Mm -hmm. So I hope this opens up to connecting with a larger audience. I think uh, both of you have provided such important insights and, and to this last point, just the reality that for research to have a, powerful impact in the real world, 
it needs to accommodate these real world experiences and the fact that we may not always have transportation to go and get treatment or we may need um, additional helping hands. I want to thank both of you for being a part of this conversation, for, for being willing to open up not just your professional experiences, but your personal experiences and talking about how we can make research better. And I, I have to say, I feel like the hour has just flown by um, like coffee with, with two new friends who feel like old friends. So I, I am just really Great. thankful for that. Um, I, if you're listening in, um, I, I would encourage you to go ahead and take a few moments to respond to the polls um, that are being launched now. And um, I will just, as a shout out to a couple of folks, um, a couple more comments we're getting in. I'm thankful for the doctors we've had that have been very responsive and have had success using my chart. Um, and that's from Sheena. And Daniel commented, he's, Daniel's ready to go with a policy solution getting a medical billing code for longer appointments with families. So, yes. you know, please, <laughs> please, yes, please continue to, to share your ideas, connect on social. We also, um, just by way of closing, want to say that we appreciate your feedback on this session and we want to make sure that we're continuing to provide great content and programming for the rare disease community. So, um, you know, you're not going to hurt our feelings and candid feedback. Please go ahead and share it. Um, to events at globalgenes.org. And we'll still be having office hours and informal networking rooms after the official close of the program at 3.30 um, p.m. Eastern. So if you're ready to get started on your Friday and um, to have, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? So, you know, if you want to have that glass of wine, have some informal networking with your colleagues, today's the day to do it. Um, and please don't miss out on that great chance to connect with others. You can also uh, meet with peers, talk to speakers and experts, and we want to make sure you have a robust toolbox that can really advance research in your own community. With that, I, I want to hand things off to my colleague, Christian Rubio. Once again, thank you, Jennifer and Sharon Rose. It was so awesome to talk with you both. And Christian, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What an amazing panel you've been, and, and you really have helped put a capstone on an incredible time here. So uh, thank you once more. Um, it's my privilege to really just close this out and provide the, the proper acknowledgments and, and really put some uh, final thoughts to uh, what, we've, what we've been through together for the past uh, couple of days. So first, thank you again to our incredible keynote speakers. Thank you, Doctors Wilson and Rudder, for helping us understand with clarity where we are at this time at the intersection of research and advocacy. And thank you, Donna Cryer and David Fagenbaum, for being on, uh, for being for really embodying what rare disease champions look like and and are capable of uh, when we have a plan and when we work together. Um, your inspirations to us all, and uh, you summarize so eloquently the deep dives on topics we covered across the session. And getting into those kind of closing thoughts and takeaways. Just wanted to part with some very simple, straightforward um, ideas that kept recurring according to kind of what we saw as a team um, and what we what a lot of the conversations were about. So first and foremost to our attendees, don't be intimidated getting started. A great first small, easy step is just having a list of patient contacts. And don't be afraid of reaching out to researchers, doctors and, and us or anyone else here to start making your connections. The people you talk to, the, the, more, the more people you talk to, the more people you'll find will help you from one, get from one, ne one step to the next. And patient advocacy organizations are key to identifying barriers to access. Uh, barriers to access are being considered and sometimes addressed earlier, and patient advocacy organizations are key to identifying them through research and community engagement. Barriers to access for some are barriers to good data and outcomes for all. Addressing unconscious bias is all our shared responsibility and to make sure we build research and development pipelines that are for everyone. Patients and caregivers, as always, are the real experts. Your experiences and those of your community are what it's all about. Your stories are the data and your data properly organized can get researchers and ultimately industry working with you. Repurposing remains a key path forward. It's faster and safer and comes with a network of clinicians, researchers, and industry. And if you want to learn more about how to harness drug repurposing, reach out to us at Global Genes, the Jumpstart team at UPenn and NCATS and many other partners we can connect you with. Uh, also collaborations are difficult, but essential. 
but researchers, outcome measures, and endpoints need more patient inclusion and patient organization partnership. For advocacy leaders, patients, and caregivers, the more we know about how to develop these validatable data sets, the more education uh, we can engage, the more collaborations will flourish. And finally, another one of our key themes was that interoperability of data needs to be the norm. It's on everyone's minds. We need to keep striving for sharing and standardizing data in and across research projects. So with that, I'd, I'd just like to remind everybody, we covered a lot of ground at the symposium this year. A lot of resources were shared. If you missed anything, if you want to find something that maybe you're not able to find on the platform, even though the platform will stay open for a couple of weeks more, please email us at events at globalgenes.org. We will be happy to route you either to the people or the resources you're looking for to take your next step. Also, while we have you, the financial advocacy in RARE, the Fair Patient Impact Grant, uh, remains open currently until the end of the month. And the goal is to fund some proposals around promoting financial health and positive financial decision-making for patients and caregivers impacted by rare disease. Grants will be awarded to rare disease patient advocacy organizations seeking to expand research, resource development, outreach, education, and awareness efforts uh, around financial literacy, as well as financial advocacy and planning. Of course, in this summer, registration for the summit uh, opens in July, as well as nominations for Champions of Hope. Um, we are also going to be launching our online community where, uh, or actually relaunching our community portal, where many of the conversations we had here and the resources referenced will be archived and attendees will be able to maintain that network and keep building your connections uh, with each other. So we look forward to that. And if you're interested in learning more about that, please, again, shoot us an email or contact um, Daniel, who I believe is in the chat right now, who, who's happy to take any interest from potential beta testers on that. Some final reminders. Um, the Achievements and Badges Leaderboard is going to stay open and it's found on your main event menu. Um, you can earn those badges by performing any number of meaningful action, actions on the platform. And the top participants will be eligible for complimentary registrations for either the 2021 Patient Advocacy uh, Summit or the 2022 uh, Rare Drug Development Symposium. Uh, if there are more than two attendees at the top, uh, then two winners will be selected from a drawing and notified after the event. Additionally, we want to remind you, of course, that I stand right now between you and the next and last um, networking session and office hours, which will start uh, very uh, basically momentarily. Um, please join us to discuss the content of the day, meet your peers, and connect with speakers and experts. Um, and by the way, if you enjoyed or didn't enjoy any specific things about the conference platform, we use to host this online symposium, please send us some feedback. Um, like everybody, we're always trying to strive for a more engaging and better um, fine event online. Uh, and we certainly continue to do that. So please, by all means, send us your thoughts. And thank you, our attendees, for being the champions of hope that you all are. Thank you to the amazing Global Genes staff and Orphan Disease Center staff, especially Anne and Samantha, who did amazing jobs throughout of, of uh, helping put this all together. Thanks to the production team and the green room guys and, and ladies who did so much to keep us all organized and keep us energized uh, behind the scenes. And we can't wait to see all of you in person soon. Have a great relaxing summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and please stay safe. And remember that we're all allies in rare diseases and stronger together. You too.